philosophy of science since 2010. From 2017 to 2020, he holds a Wilson Research Professorship granted by the British Academy. Previously, he taught for 15 years at University College London, having received a PhD in philosophy from Stanford University after an undergraduate degree from the California Institute of Technology. Put your hands together to welcome Professor Hassan. So, uh, pleased to be the first one, at least for a while. And what I thought I would do is, assuming that most of you are scientists, I'm going to try to tell you why anyone, most of all, we are scientists like you guys, should care about the history of science. I mean, I care about it because I make a living doing history and philosophy of science, but, you know, practicing scientists, busy people, why should they worry about, especially the history, I mean, it's all the wrong stuff that's been put away, right? Why should we worry about that? Um, so I want to give you some sense of that, drawing especially from my own research, which is really always motivated by science itself. I was just explaining to Ragavi that I was an undergraduate student of physics. I had my big dreams to at least be the next Feynman or something. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> Two reasons it didn't work. One, because I wasn't that clever. Um, the other reason, even more than that, was that all the questions I got really interested in were not things that the real physicists cared about. They told me that these were all philosophical questions, and after hearing that for four years, I decided then I have to go and become a philosopher, which is not how I started. So um, you will get a sense of more of that as I speak. So I'm going to try to talk till about 7 o'clock, and then take questions and answers as long as you guys want. So, as a um, student of science, you will <coughs> come across history of science, usually at the beginning of your textbooks or something, or you may have some exposure to popular science, and you're going to hear about this kind of thing. The infamous story about how Newton discovered gravity by taking a nap under the apple tree and getting bumped on the head. Now, if you know any historians of science, you know how upset we get about this kind of story, which is really mythology. Right? I mean, we know full well this is not how Isaac Newton came to the idea of universal gravitation, but these stories are told over and over. Um, why, you might ask? And I'm going to come to that in a moment. Somebody made an updated version of that. Okay. It's good in one respect. It looks a lot more like the real Isaac Newton than the other picture. And he's up to date. He's tweeting about his discovery. Um, but you know, if we're going to hear these mythological stories, then I prefer to go back to a little joke that I heard from a mate at uni, a guy called Liho, I still remember him, he was from Singapore. He said, well, you know, actually the joke is, gravity wasn't discovered by Isaac Newton first, it was discovered by an Asian person, sitting not under an apple tree, but under a durian tree. <laughs> Except they didn't live, so um, 
the story was lost along with the insight. If you've never seen a durian, uh, yeah, if you have, you'll know what I mean. Now, we do tell these stories for reasons, right? And we can do better than the story about Newton under the upper tree. So there are many stories that you'll hear if you're interested in the history of science. So these actually are real stories, unlike Newton and the apple. And they are told because they, they excite curiosity and they excite interest in science. So these come in as so-called human interest stories. Again, at the beginning of textbooks or when, when people are trying to get the general public interested in science. So you know, the, the example that I put on the top, some of you may know this one, the story of the German chemist August Kekulé, who discovered the structure of the benzene molecule, right? the benzene ring, the hexagonal structure. And the story that he told himself, or Kekulé himself, was that he had a dream in which a snake was biting its own tail. And he woke up and said, that's it. <laughs> because until then, nobody had thought of the structure of organic molecules as a closed loop. So he was trying to figure out right, how six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms would sensibly connect to each other to make one molecule. He couldn't do it. Nobody else could do it except by thinking about it as a ring. So in you know, these stories excite curiosity and inspiration, and you know, they, they often touched up a bit, but they are real stories. So there is a function that these stories serve. But that's not what I want to talk about today, because in order to tell these inspiring stories, you don't need professional historians of science. <coughs> Anybody can be, tell these stories. So that's not what I want to talk about. Um, I'm going to think with you about what it is that people who aren't busy practicing scientists can do for history of science and what use that history of science can be for scientists. So in this little diagram, I, I give you a schema for all the different things that history of science can do. Right? And I divide the functions of the history of science to, into internal and external. Right? So, yeah, I mean, people have reasons for doing history. Historians do it just simply to understand the past. History of science may be useful, for example, to people who make science policy. Right? We need to understand how science has worked through history if we want to make good policy about how to encourage this continued development and so on. But I want to think about the functions of learning about history that's internal to science, to scientific research and education. And this you don't need to worry about too much, but I divide that internal function into what is orthodox, and what is complementary. The orthodox being what we are practicing scientists would do and worry about. Complementary being what people like me can do um, that scientists themselves don't worry about. And under the complementary function, I have three categories which I'm going to tell you about. One is the critical awareness about our knowledge. One is the recovery of knowledge that scientists can actually forget as science marches on in its relentless progress. And what I call extension is how you might build on that recovery. Now, all of that is very abstract. You probably think, what is this guy talking about? So I'm going to stop talking in the abstract right now and give you some examples to illustrate these three categories of what history of science can tell you about science. So what I call critical awareness. Take a simple example, something that 
Every school child knows, like, the earth rotates around the sun, not the sun rotates around the earth. Every child, and most grown-ups, not all of them, know this. But what do we mean by <coughs> them knowing it? Oh, well, what they can do is they can recite this. They can give the right answer on the exam. But if you ask the school child who can recite this item of knowledge, but how do we know this? Right? What is the, can you tell me the evidence right, on the basis of which we believe that the Earth is moving around the sun as well as spinning around its own axis? Does the child or any of us see the Earth moving? No. Look at it. Right? So how is it that humanity decided that the old system of astronomy, in which the Earth was at the center, everything else revolved around it, was wrong. And this idea from Copernicus, like that the sun was at the center, Earth going around it. How did humans decide that that was the right story? And when you look at the history, you realize what a difficult debate that was. Right? The famous Thomas Kuhn actually wrote an entire book about how that argument went before he wrote his famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. And there are lots of examples like this. Um, why do we think the foundation of what we take to be scientific knowledge is so secure? Well, usually we just believe it because we've been taught at school. And this happens also at higher levels. So this is an example from, well, roughly speaking, my university days. So many of you will have run the special theory of relativity. And even if you haven't, you've probably heard of this wonderful length contraction effect. Right? So if a rigid body will be moving at a certain speed, it gets shorter, says Einstein, by this factor gamma which is a function of the speed at which the thing moves, a v, compared to the speed of light, c. So if v will be c, that gamma factor will be infinity. So the length of contraction that. OK, let's not talk about extreme things. Just at any speed, there will be a finite value of gamma, which is larger than 1. Okay. So now let's suppose you take a rigid disk like you would have in the middle of a big table at the Chinese restaurant. And you rotate it. You get it moving. And then what should happen? Length contraction happens along the direction of motion, right? So the circumference of this circle should contract by the factor gamma. The radius, being perpendicular to the direction of motion, should not be affected. So what would you have? You have a disk whose circumference is less than 2 pi times the radius. There is no such circle, not to mention a physical disk. So what, what the heck? Right. Um, what is the answer? There is no answer. So if you worry about this kind of thing, you can't do your physics. And that's what happened to me. If you look at the history of it, my colleague uh, called Richard Staley has written about this. The history is that <laughs> they didn't solve this problem. In fact, what they learned is that if they go seriously into relativity, the notion of a rigid body makes no sense. It's, a, it's an incoherent notion. Oh, and that's OK, because in general relativity, you don't need, you don't have rigid bodies. But the philosopher would ask, but hang on, in special relativity, Einstein defined the very notion of the frame of reference using a system of rigid meter sticks and clocks, right? So what happens to that? Don't worry, is the answer from the physicist. But I, my belief is when you are aware of these difficult questions at the foundation of scientific knowledge, 
you have superior knowledge. If there are uncertainties, if there are difficult questions, you should know that. Now, let me illustrate this in more detail by going back to something very simple. You know, it's not quite the Earth revolves around the sun, but water, right? Being H2O, everybody knows that. And then you can ask again, but how do we know that? I mean, even if you're a student of chemistry, take a minute to think back. How do I know that water is H2O? If not, because you can see these nice molecules. I mean, some people imagine that if you just take an electron microscope at a glass of water, you can see these molecules, and they will not be talked out of that notion unless you know something about electron microscopes. So, how do we, how did people get so sure about this piece of knowledge? And the history of that goes back to this guy, John Dalton, you've all heard of him, right? so called father of chemical atomism, published this book in the year 1808, called The New System of Chemical Philosophy. Very grand title from John Dalton. If you know anything about publishing 200 years ago, you always got on the title page, I like somebody's old CD. At least it would be John Dalton, professor of chemistry at the University of Oxford or whatever. But John Dalton was just John Dalton, because he wasn't the professor of anything anywhere. He was not even, I mean, PhDs didn't exist back then. John Dalton was from a poor family. He had to stop going to school at age 11. And then he decided, ah, I'm going to teach. <laughs> he taught himself, just reading books, and earned his living as a private tutor, and than at various schools. This is where he was from, a little place called Eagles Field in the Lake District, as we would now say. And apparently you can go and stay at his own house. It's been turned into a B&B. Eagles Field looks like that now. So you can imagine 200 years ago, it was really middle of nowhere. So he came out of there and out of no established academic tradition and gave us chemical atomism. Now, I, I've fallen back into the human interest story, which is fascinating, but that's not what I want to tell you about. What I want to tell you about today is this. This is a picture from a second part of his book published in 1810, in which he gives you literally pictures of atoms. Right, so he made up his own symbols um, for atoms, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and so on. And look at, so these are the elements, if you will. These are the compounds. Look at number 37, which is his picture of the water molecule. Not H2O, it's HO. How did he get that so wrong? But how did the chemist decide it was wrong? <laughs> and how do we decide whether water, I mean, you can easily decide that water is a compound of hydrogen and oxygen, right? You can make it that way, you can break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. Actually, even that wasn't so easy, but let's pretend that was easy. But how do you know, short of being able to pick up a water molecule with some tweezers, count up the number of atoms, how can you decide whether it's HO or H2O? Because all we know from observation, I mean, at least 200 years ago, is the combining weight ratios, right? So you can tell from measurements that it will be always one gram of hydrogen combining with eight grams of oxygen making nine grams of water. That you can do. 
That's all you can do. So if you want to decide the atomic weight, if you want to decide the molecular formula of this thing, you can't get started. If you know the molecular formula, then you can infer the atomic weight. If you know the atomic weight already, you can infer the molecular formula, but it's, it's circular, so it goes like this, right? So we know that one to eight combination happens. Now, is that because the water molecule is H2O and the atomic weights of hydrogen and oxygen are in the ratio of one to 16, right? That would make sense. Or is it because it's one-to-one -one combination and the atomic weights are in the one-to-eight ratio. Each of these stories is completely, not only self-consistent, but consistent with the evidence, right? And how do you break what philosophers of science call the underdetermination of theories by evidence? Right? The evidence tells you something, but it doesn't tell you which one of these possibilities is the right answer. And, and if you have a mathematical mind, you, you immediately saw that there's an infinite number of these possible combinations of atomic weights and molecular formulae that, that would give you the one to eight ratio that you observe. So John Dalton said, my solution is that nature is simple. This is the kind of thing scientists still say. So Dalton said, I know of only one compound made up from hydrogen and oxygen, because they hadn't yet discovered hydrogen peroxide. That was a few years later. So poor Dalton only knew of water. And he said, why would God have made this any more complicated than a one-to-one -one combination? If you don't like God, you can call it Occam's razor or whatever simplistic. So that's Dalton's solution. And that's how we got this HO formula. How do you argue with this? Right? Why would you think Dalton was wrong in thinking water was HO? I mean, the most you could say is, well, he wasn't, he couldn't have been sure. He shouldn't have concluded it. But what would be the positive evidence that water is H2O? And some of you know something about this answer, which is that it's all due to this funny looking man, Amadeo Avogadro. That, that's the best that the portrait painter could do. So we're not here to talk about Gifford's rules. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> Avogadro had this idea that you could have access to the molecular reality that Dalton couldn't have just by measuring weight. How? It goes back to the discovery made by the French physicist and chemist Gay Lussac. Some of you will know his name. Right? What Gay Lussac discovered is a really curious regularity, which is that when chemical reactions happen between gases, rather than liquids or solids. The volumes of gases involved form this very simple ratio. Right? So when water is made, they start notice, you know, under the same conditions of pressure and temperature and so on, it was always two volumes of hydrogen combining with one volume of oxygen. So you can almost just immediately read off the H2O formula. So learning Gay Lussac's empirical result, Avogadro, who had a much more theoretical mind, said, that's it. <laughs> I know why Dalton is wrong and it's H2O. And you have to make an assumption, right, which I tried to express here, that equal volume of all the different gases have the equal number of basic particles in it, right? So, I couldn't bear to draw more than four in each box. So it's Avogadro's number, not four um, in each mole of stuff, right? So if you have that assumption, then you can see how 
the barnum's would form this very simple ratio but that's nice is that the end of the story no because something that gave this up and everybody else knew was that this story didn't really work because when you made water in this way and when the water form was in the gas form so water vapor it formed two volumes and it should have been just one right if the number of overall h2o particles would be four in this picture it should just form one volume but facts tell you that it's two volumes so hmm, any kind of normal person would have just said right that was a nice idea but it doesn't really work Avogadro was not a normal person so he said no no my assumption must be correct he said so what must be happening is after the water molecules form they must break up in half so then you have eight particles two volumes we're happy are we happy no because if you split an h2o molecule into two what do you get you get one hydrogen atom and half an oxygen atom, which is total nonsense, right? The basic notion of atom was that it wasn't separable. Certainly not in half, right? So did Avogadro give up then? No, he never gave up. He said, in that case, I will double everything so that hydrogen is two atoms stuck together, H2, Oxygen is two atoms stuck together, O2, and they initially form H4O2, which then split up into halves. Now we are happy. <laughs> so did everyone go home happy? No, I mean, Avogadro's ideas were completely rejected by the vast majority of chemists and didn't come back until 50 years later. Why? You might think, right? Some historians of the science have asked, ah, why did the chemists of Europe let this gem of an insight go? Why did they let it slip through their fingers? Well, because when you think about it, Avogadro's story didn't make any sense, by which I mean physical sense. Right? Why would two atoms of hydrogen stick together? And if two will stick together, why not three, why not four, why not the entire room until it all comes? Now the answer to that question, why two hydrogen atoms would stick together, was not given until quantum mechanics, right? We have no other explanation of that until at least 1928 or so, and we're talking now about 1811, so there's no way that anyone would have made sense of why H2 and O2 would be stable molecules. Worse than that, the dominant theory of chemical combination, going back to Berzelius and Davy at the time, was electrostatic, right? They thought hydrogen was plus, oxygen was minus, that's why they attracted each other. I mean, it's not bad, right? And if that is your picture, then two hydrogen atoms should repel each other, not to mention stick to each other. So people looked at Avogadro and said two things. One, you just made up that entire story, right? Just by trying to maintain your initial fantasy about equal volumes of gases containing equal number of molecules. And any physical theory we have tends to go against it. So this becomes now a very long story. How is it that then in the next half century, people eventually came round to Avogadro's way of thinking, and the story got so long that I ended up writing a whole book about that. So I'm not going to tell you the long story, which has to do with valency, right? They had to go through organic chemistry to figure out the valency of basic elements. So when you figure it out, hydrogen has valency one, oxygen has two, then you say it has to
not until then, and you don't get that story unless you go to some complex organic chemistry. So the story, if you're curious, is in that book of mine, is the cover image of which I'm flashing. So I hope that gives you a sense of the kind of critical awareness I'm talking about. Right? So rather than just reciting water is H2O, let's move on to more complex things. No, stop. Why do we think water is H2O? How did the great chemist of the world figure this out? And that's a very long and complex story. So now I'm going to move on to the second of the three complementary functions of history of science. So I've covered critical awareness, now comes what I call recovery. Now this is going to sound really unlikely that there are things that scientists forget from what they used to know as science makes great progress. The prime example of that I'm going to give you, well, I'm going to give you two examples. The first one goes back to this man, Gary Sack, whom I mentioned in, the, in connection with Avogadro. Right? So I was doing another line of research about the history of temperature and heat and thermometers and all that. Um, Gary Sack, who was a great experimentalist, reported that Right? If you get pure distilled water under standard pressure, boil it in a nice metallic container, sure enough, it boils at exactly 100 degrees centigrade. Okay, so what? He then reported, if you boil it in a glass container, like your usual lab beakers and things, it says it boils at 101.232 degrees. So you can imagine me reading this 200 and some years later and say, no, right? That shouldn't happen. But then two things. One, like I just said, Gilisak was probably the greatest experimental physicist of his time. I mean, this guy was big. He would not make a basic mistake about boiling water. So I thought, well, there might be something to this. And the second thought I had is, well, how difficult would it be to check? So I asked my chemist colleagues to let me into the lab. They said, what do you want to do? I said, I'd like to boil some water. <laughs> I explained the historical background. And, and this wonderful chemist colleague I had at UCF called Andrea Sella. He said, OK, we will let you into a teaching lab in the summer. What do you need? So I told him I need a Bunsen burner and some distilled water. So he laughed and let me have this. And I checked, and sure enough, this is what happens. Now, Gilbisak was exaggerating the precision of his measurements. But other than that, the boiling temperature in a glass vessel is higher consistently than in a metallic vessel. And I'm going to just give you one of the punchlines early by telling you that this is true. And there are experts about boiling who know more of this and much more today. But in Gilgisak's time, this was a really common knowledge. It was reported also by his friend Eo in his textbook of physics for the French university students. Everybody knew about this 200 years ago. How many of you knew that? Probably not many. The experts don't teach you this in your physics class because they're not physicists. They're engineers. They're, they're mostly in mechanical and chemical engineering. The reason they worry about boiling is they use it as a method of heat transfer. So think about cooling uh, down your nuclear reactor and that sort of thing. And for doing that, they have to know exactly how it goes. The theory is no good. They have to know the right phenomenology. So they know all about these 
let's see, knee caves. The man who taught me more about boiling than de Lussac even was this guy, Swiss physicist, geologist, theologian, all kinds of things, called the Luc. He wrote this book in 1772 about meteorology. And he got worried about whether his thermometers were correct. And then he got worried about how thermometers are made in the first place. So the standard method then being using the freezing point and boiling point of water. He got worried about boiling and kind of never came out of that rabbit hole. <laughs> Before he sent this book to press, he added 15 chapters about boiling because it was such a mess. And I learned a lot from him. And he has this very valid complaint, which is that usually when we do experiments to pick the boiling point of water, we do it like this. Like you have a very intense heat source, like naked flame kind of thing. And then you have, have water boiling. You plunge a thermometer into the middle of the water. Right? You're taking the temperature of the water here, pause. He noted quite correctly, that's not where the vapor bubbles are coming from. The vapor bubbles are coming from this immediate bottom layer, which is in touch with the really, really hot heat source. So the look complained that we're, we're just all measuring the wrong thing here. Because what you want to know, right, is, is where the boiling begins in what he called the first layer of water in contact with the heat source but we're just going somewhere else to measure the temperature. Well, you, you know why we had to do it that way? Because, I mean, no thermometer was small enough to get to the very first layer of water. So the look said, we have to get around this problem somehow. So he said, he did this experiment in which um, he eliminated this wide open surface of the water through which a lot of heat is lost. So he said, well, we're going to use a thin neck flask and fill the water right up to the neck to minimize that surface area. And we're going to heat the water very slowly so as to bring the entire body of it to the same temperature. So what happens when you do that? I'm going to show you what happens when you do that. So this is my homemade experiment, and this is my approximation of the Lux arrangement. So you see in a moment I'm using a hot plate, which is hot, but not that hot compared to an open flame, right? So you see in this volumetric flask, the water level is coming up. Oh, sorry. That's where the water level is. So after a while, it starts boiling, and you see the thermometer spliced. So, so far, exactly what you expect. Right? 100 degrees, boiling begins. Now keep watching. You should notice two things. One, the temperature keeps creeping up beyond the 100. Two, the bubbling changes. There are fewer bubbles and bigger bubbles. And now the bubbles are so big that they're beginning to push water out of the flask. Now you got to about 102. And then it goes completely quiet. And very large occasional bubbles come. You would think it stopped boiling because it cooled down or something. But you'll see in a moment what the temperature is. When it's doing that, it's about 104. Doing absolutely nothing until a huge bubble comes. So that's an entirely typical way in which boiling happens if you will do it in this particular situation. And there's a lot more to that. So there's recovery, right? I learned all this kind of thing 
from a book that was 230 years old. And that was a surprise because, you know, as uh, mentioned in the introduction, I, you know, I tried and got an elite education in physics. Nothing of this was ever mentioned in my physics education. In fact, I mean, they didn't talk about boiling at all, except as this line in the nice phase diagram, right? And that line is completely sharp. None of this so-called superheating stuff is supposed to happen. So that's the lesson in recovery. And there are lots of other examples which I'm not going to cover, but I want to show you one. This is a very simple experiment that was published uh, in 1801 by this man called William Hyde Wollaston in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, the place to publish poems. I mean, we've still got the film trends today, but back then it was really the most prestigious place to publish science. And so you, you have a paper in that venue, you pay attention. And who was this guy, Wollaston? Um, he was an amateur scientist in London. Interestingly, his brother, Francis, was the professor of chemistry here in Cambridge. But William was the better chemist. That, that's how it went those days. There were a lot of superior amateur scientists back then, like Dorton, uh, like Wollaston, who were much better scientists than these people who managed to finagle university chairs. So that's another lesson. So this is what Wollaston says. Experiment one, if a piece of zinc and a piece of silver have each one extremity immersed in the same vessel containing sulfuric or muriatic acid diluted with water. Okay, muriatic acid, that, that's the old term for hydrochloric acid. This was before chlorine was discovered, so they couldn't have called it hydrochloric acid. So HCl or H, H2SO4, uh, get a dilute acid, and you dip a piece of zinc, a piece of silver in. OK, so what? Um, the zinc is dissolved and yields hydrogen gas, hydrogen bubbles up. And silver is impervious to these acids. So nothing happens to the silver. But whenever the zinc and silver are made to touch, each other, hydrogen gas is also formed at the surface of the silver. Okay, so I had another one of those reactions, which is, I don't think so. Why would that happen? Uh, but then again, um, this is such a simple experiment by a, such a talented scientist. How would he get this wrong? <laughs> and how hard is that's going to be to check. So again, I did my experiment. And helpfully, it tells you any other metal besides zinc, which is you know, dissolved by the acid, works. And any other metal than silver, which doesn't dissolve in the acid, also works. Good, because I didn't have any pieces of silver to play with. So I used zinc and copper. And that's that experiment. Beautifully simple. Now, can you? See the bubbles of hydrogen coming out of the zinc wire. Good. And then you see a copper wire going in. Nothing at all happens. And then you're going to see that's my gloved hand trying to connect up the two wires. I'm being a little clumsy, but oh, the projection is not the best either. But you can hopefully see now the bubbles are coming off the copper as well. Now, what you need to know is that the copper is not dissolving at all. <coughs> it's just producing these bubbles of hydrogen, precisely as Wollaston said. So there's another piece of scientific knowledge that I learned from reading something 200 years old. Something so simple. <coughs> I showed that to my chemist colleagues, and they said, yeah, OK. That's a little 
It's such a simple experiment. I mean, how would you even avoid doing this experiment if you're doing anything with metals and acids? But my chemist didn't know about it. But that's another example of recovery, and it also leads me to the last theme, which is what I call extension. <coughs> which is, well, I mean, th this is me being a scientist in spirit, even though I'm not officially a scientist. I mean, you've done an experiment, you want to know more about it, right? You want to know how to make sense of it, you want to know what happens if you slightly vary the experiment, and so on. That, that's what a scientist would do, right? So that's what I call extension. So having seen that weird result, I wanted to make sense of it in the kind of way that I could understand as a semi-educated modern person. <laughs> Wollaston had his own story, but it didn't make sense to me. So I thought, how do I make sense of this experiment? And to cut a rather long story short, this is the best I could do in a semi-modern term. Initially, I was focusing on what the hydrogen ions in the acid were going to be doing to the zinc, but that's the red herring. That doesn't explain anything. You have to focus on what the chloride ion in HCl, hydrochloric acid, would be doing, right? The chloride ions can pull out zinc plus plus ions, which would then release a couple of electrons, right? And then these electrons would be free to go over to the copper side and then meet the abundant hydrogen ions there. Two of them will make H2, bubbles up as hydrogen gas. Right? That makes sense. And what you then realize is you've just made a battery. And this is precisely the configuration of Volta's original battery. It doesn't look like it, but I'll explain in a moment. And the reason Wollaston made that experiment was in order to try to understand Volta's battery, which had been invented just a year before. In the year 1800, Volta published this discovery, and it was a total sensation. Right? Because electricity until then was just the static stuff. Rubbing stuff together and zapping each other, and it was basically a parlor game, nothing useful. And Volta invented this thing, right, with which he could make steady current in an electric circuit. And how did he do it? Well, this is the basic unit here. They called it the Volta pile because literally it was a pile of two different pieces of metals and something wet, and then repeat. So in Volta's original arrangement, it's, it was silver, zinc, and the dark layer shown in the picture is a wet piece of cardboard or cloth or paper. Initially, he just used plain water. We have to think there was enough impurities in the water to make it work. Later, he said, I use salt water, and that works really good. OK, so that's the Volta set. So Wollaston's experiment used an acid. Volta didn't use an acid, he used salt water, basically NaCl solution. Right? And then it gave me another puzzle, which is, so if I try to understand Wollaston's experiment in this way, but I'm stuck with a puzzle concerning Volta's cell because if we think in the same way, electrons come over and come out into the solution, but what then happens? Who's going to meet the electrons in your salt water? Because the salt water is not full of hydrogen ions. What it is full of is sodium ions, Na+. You can all guess what would happen if the electrons met sodium ions and made elemental sodium in the middle of water. Right? <laughs> would burst out in flames, and that doesn't happen, I can guarantee you. You do this experiment, it's a very quiet experiment. 
that thing exciting happens, current flows, but where are the electrons going? And there's another puzzle, which is why do the electrons go all the way over to that side, rather than just come out and do whatever they do over on the zinc side? So, many questions. Now, you would think, but we all learn at GCSE how batteries work. So, don't we just have to look up the textbook? Well, what you will find if you look up your old textbooks or your current ones is this. It's the Daniel set, which is a very different configuration from the voltaic set. The Daniel set is nice because you basically, you've got two metals, each of them dipped into its own solution, as it were. Each side has a nice, redox potential, you just take the difference of those redox potentials, gives you the cell voltage. You can't do that with this. So how do you explain this? Well, they don't tell you how this thing works in basic chemistry. And when you get to advanced electrochemistry, of course they don't talk about this, because it's too elementary. <laughs> so you never learn how the, the original battery of human civilization actually worked. So I wanted to know, right? And I had this idea. Okay, so let me solve the puzzle this way. So I want to know what electrons do when they come out to sodium chloride solution. But I must not be really seeing what happens because there are not a lot of electrons coming out. So the idea I had was I'm going to vary this experiment by pumping a lot of electrons into the solution by putting a battery in here. I mean, this itself is a battery, but I got my Duracell and stuck it in here uh, with the negative end going to the copper. So what would happen then? That's what happened. The mess, right, which didn't tell me anything that I wanted to know, because what happens here is not only does the zinc oxidize, forming the white oxide, but zinc ions also travel over to the copper side and get picked up. They need electrons there and make zinc deposits. That's not what I wanted to know. So I thought, right, I have to get rid of the zinc. So now I'm doing a completely different experiment with copper on both sides, pumping electrons into one of them, and that's what happens. As soon as the battery is connected, yeah, you get a lot of hydrogen gas forming, which is, I mean, in retrospect, that's what you should expect. Right? Because what happens here is you just, you're breaking down H2O molecules right there and then, making lots of hydrogen. And then after a while, this interesting orange stuff Forms. That's the um, plus side copper wire dissolving and forming a compound. It's a, actually an interesting question what that orange gunk is. At the bottom of the test tube, you see what you would expect the, the typical blue green of copper ions. Right? Another long story short, I think the orange stuff is copper one hydroxide, if you care about that kind of thing. That's supposed to form in highly alkaline environments, which this would be if on the other side, H2O is breaking down, making hydrogen gas, there'd be lots of OH minus being formed. Anyway, you can look into that if you're interested. But you can see what I mean by extension here. Right? I started out by reproducing Wollaston's curious experiment but wanting to understand that in the way that I, as a modern scientific person, can understand, led me to these very interesting modern scientific questions and results. I mean, again, my chemist colleagues didn't have an immediate answer as to what this orange stuff was. And Vera Sella, I mentioned before, said, yeah, there's that, that hydroxide copper one hydroxide possibility, and I looked into it, and that's another story. But I just want to show you one more thing before I finish and open up for questions. Again, in, on the side of extension. 
So this was really interesting, but that's not what I was going for. Right? I didn't want to understand some complex chemistry of copper. I was trying to understand what happens when you put electrons into salt water. So I decided that what I needed was chemically inert electrodes, right? So they don't mess up what I'm trying to investigate by reacting with stuff. So I thought, okay, I have to now go to gold as an electrode that won't do anything. So that's what I set up. I had only one piece of gold wire. So the other side you see here is graphite. It's also good, right? also inert. And I got a modern power supply instead of my little batteries. So that's the setup. Now I'm electrolyzing an ACL solution with these two inert electrodes. Nothing happens at all up to about 2 volts. At 2.2, something starts happening. You can probably see in this picture there are tiny bubbles forming on the graphite side. That's hydrogen if you patiently collect it. Up the voltage a bit more and something very curious is happening. I don't know if you can see. Bigger picture again. The video at three volts. Not what I was expecting. The gold wire is dissolving in my salt water at three volts, which is two little batteries, which is what it was originally when I did the experiment. This is the more careful addition, varying the voltage. Again, None of my chemist colleagues had seen less. Interesting. So I thought, okay, higher voltage. What happens? 3.5. Yeah. The same thing happening more at a higher rate. And what is this yellow piss like stuff? Must be a gold chloride of some kind. That's as far as I got. I'm still asking around and uh, thinking. But the last, very last thing I want to show you is what I did next, which is right. I'm going to keep increasing the voltage because this is exciting. But by the time I got to 4.2, the, the solution of gold stopped. Instead, in the gold side, it was making bubbles. And I started smelling something like a swimming pool or bleach. Then I had to immediately stop the experiment because what I was making was chlorine. And you don't want to breathe chlorine gas. Um, that, you may know, was the very first chemical weapon ever used in the history of warfare. Um, what I was making here is probably not just chlorine gas, which would also be green. Um, it was probably a reaction product of chlorine gas and water. Anyway, that's where I'm going to stop because I've talked too long already. Um, but just to sum up, I hope I've given you a concrete enough sense of what looking at some very old science with your eyes open can actually teach you. And it can teach you stuff that regular science won't teach you. This is, I'm not condemning the scientists. The scientists are the way they are because that's what they need in order to train you intensely into doing the cutting edge science that, that you will be doing if you continue on. And they are themselves very busy doing the cutting edge of research. But one not so nice byproduct of that way of doing science is that all of this kind of stuff that I've been giving you in the last hour gets lost. And as I see it, part of the mission of the history of science and the philosophy of science is to keep those questions alive and occasionally give them back to the scientists. <laughs> Hopefully you can make something useful out of it. So let me really stop here. Thank you for your attention.